Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. And if it's your first time here, I'm Janetta, an author who loves to draw. On my channel, I focus on combining storytelling with art. If that's something you're interested in, please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Let's get to it. Chapter 29. Dante was relieved that Hunter had provided him a perfect excuse not to take Lang. He couldn't be sure what Lang's reaction would be to seeing Kane in the flesh. With Brooklyn's life on the line, he didn't want to take any chances. He and Robert walked a half mile up to the house, knowing there was no way to approach in a vehicle without being seen. Fresh tire tracks let him know that the property was being used. What he didn't know was if Brooklyn was there. He hated that they didn't have a female element along. She could have driven up to the house and pretended to ask for direction without raising too much suspicion. The house had motion sensors, they threw rocks and waved their hands in front of them several times to see if anyone would come out. When no one did, they stormed the house. Robert went through the door first. What Dante saw upon entering made him grateful that Lang was not by his side. The entire layout of the first floor, from the living room to the kitchen, was duplicated to look like Lang's house the night she lost her husband. They searched the entire house, but no one was there. I don't see where they could have been holding her, Robert stated as Dante came from the basement. Dante pointed to the door next to the curtain. What was beyond that door? It was a hallway that led out to a back door, and there was an office back there. It looked like there had been a security monitor system. Then she was here, he stated, moving through the room and searching for anything that could help them find Brooklyn. Who would need a discreet security office by a back door unless they were hiding something or somebody? Robert shrugged. I know, but none of the bedrooms looked as if they were set up to hold a hostage. One wall down the hall had a slot, but I just saw darkness when I looked in. There's too much space on that wall for nothing to be on the other side of it. Dante walked over and peeked behind the curtain. Damn. What? Robert asked as Dante held the curtain back to reveal the room beyond the plexiglass wall. Dante tried to pull the curtains back, but they weren't cooperating. Find a way in. He looked around and noticed a remote on the table. Robert had disappeared into the hallway. Dante pressed random buttons until the curtains moved back. His heart broke when he peered into the room beyond the glass wall. Without a doubt, he knew that glass box was intended for Lang. He stared at the room for a while before Robert pushed through a door in the room. Dante knew he had to keep Lang out of Kane's grasp. They had a chance of getting Brooklyn back alive but looking at the room at the moment, he knew that Kane wanted to punish Lang. He had no doubt that it would ultimately lead to Kane taking her life. Brooklyn didn't like that they were moving her. She felt like she had been in the back of the windowless van for hours with her hands tied behind her back and a rag over her mouth. They'd taken the hood off her head once they threw her in the back. Her thoughts were on what really mattered in life and all the sacrifices she made for work meant nothing at this moment. The van came to an abrupt halt, sending her body flying into the wall. The door of the van opened and a masked, burly guy stood among the darkness of night and the stars. You're definitely not in DC anymore, Brooklyn thought as he grabbed her leg, pulling her towards the door. She wanted to kick at him, but her mind was made up. Her job was to stay alive until Dante, Hunter, or the police could rescue her. She would fight for her life if it came down to that. Gus stood her up and dragged her into an old warehouse. Now she wished she had taken her chance with the burly guy outside the van. There was a lot of construction on the lower level. She knew in her heart of hearts that whatever they were building, it wasn't good. This place was whispering death, and she prayed it would not be her own. Ryan shifted nervously as he waited in the park. He had been real content with laying low until this blew over. But Hunter talked him into setting up a meeting with Megan. Megan's shapely body stepped out from the shadows of the trees. I'm glad you called me, she walked up hugging him. Ryan placed a kiss on her cheek, then looked around. I don't know if this was the best place to meet. I feel exposed right here. Let's walk. Okay, but not too far. Ryan walked, trying not to look in the direction of Dante's people. I'm so sorry. I knew it couldn't possibly be true what they were telling me, but they were watching me like a hawk. I'm amazed you got away, Megan stopped walking. 
Yes, I was just waiting for the right moment. Having a talent for breaking in also means you have a talent for breaking out. Ryan gazed at the woman he had thought he was falling in love with and felt a sadness come over him. Maybe it was a mistake reaching out to you so soon. Maybe I should. She grabbed his hand. Ryan, if you help me locate and break into Tuck's infamous vault, we can get the information needed to back these people off of us. How am I supposed to do that? Ryan asked. Tuck's dead. Megan moved closer, looking at him seductively. But his contacts aren't. There has to be someone running it. Maybe his wife knows? Are you sure doing this will allow us to go back to a normal life? Ryan asked as Megan played with her necklace, bringing his attention to her cleavage. Yes, Megan placed her hands on either side of his face. Baby, I miss you. Don't you want us back? She kissed him. Ryan ended the kiss and took her hands in his. Yes, but I can't do what you're asking. Megan snatched her hand away, then reached behind her back and pulled out a gun. I'm sorry to hear that, but at the end of the day, you will. Gus stepped out of the shadows. You may want to put that away, Ryan suggested, nodding towards her gun, then to the red dot on her chest. Megan looked over at Gus, who had his gun aimed at Ryan. Dante and his team of eight quickly came out. Robert placed his weapon to Gus' head. Dante walked over to Megan, relieving her of her gun. Megan Chambers Michaels, it's nice to finally meet you. Your parents have been looking for you. They'll be happy to know we found you. A small crew of men worked to repair the wreckage at Hunter's Club. Since the blast had only damaged the doors and the front desk area, he'd be able to reopen by the upcoming weekend. However, Hunter's focus was on Brooklyn. Devastation was the only word to describe what he felt when Dante returned with news that they found where Brooklyn had been held, but not before Kane had moved her to another location. Megan and her goon hadn't given Dante any information on Kane's and Brooklyn's whereabouts. It was frustrating. The only thing they learned was that Kane was holding over Gus's head the fact that Gus had killed a woman with his car and then covered it up. They also learned that he was the one that took out the real Alex McNair. The only thing Megan let slip was they were looking for Tuck's wife, but no one had seen her since his funeral. While Gus told them how Kane got his hooks in him, it took them a while to figure out that Gus was more scared of Kane than he was of doing jail time. That in itself was interesting, seeing that trying to avoid jail time was what landed him under Kane's thumb to begin with. Hunter was pissed off when Dante informed him that they had to release Megan and Gus to the authorities. He had Vince do some digging into Gus. Vince informed them a short time later that they would get nothing on Kane's location from Gus because Kane had Gus' family. It was frustrating to now be back at square one, even though they had two people who held the information they needed. The objective became finding a properties that were purchased within the time frame that Brooklyn had been snatched. Though Hunter was functional on fumes, getting some much needed sleep wasn't an option. He felt guilty sleeping when Brooklyn was still out there. In the last week, they had searched for every suspicious property purchase that was within a three-hour drive from where she had been. This week, they expanded to a six-hour radius. A knock on Hunter's office door poured his attentions away from the list of properties on the screen. It's open, he yelled. The club manager opened the door, peeking his head in. I just want you to know everything's set for the reopening this weekend. Good, you'll be running everything on your own for the next few weeks. Hunter glanced at the box holding the last of his personal items. After today, I'll be working remotely and can only be contacted in emergencies. If you can't reach me, call one of the other club managers to help out. Thanks, Mr. Torres. I appreciate this opportunity. Just show me I selected the right man for the job, Hunter stated as his manager left the room. He frowned when he saw Vince's number on the display. There was no way Vince could have checked the properties Hunter had sent him. He literally had just hit sin before his club manager knocked on the door. You got the list of properties I just sent over, he inquired and put answering the call. Vince ignored his question, dropped whatever you're doing and head to Levi's. Why are you sending me to him? You two aren't even on speaking terms. Where are you, Vince asked. Hunter stood and walked over to his office door, locking it. In my office at the club. Lock your gun up in a safe and head to Levi's immediately, Vince commanded. 
Levi's place is almost five hours from here. By the time you get there, I should have confirmation on Brooklyn's location. Vince? Hunter, do you trust me? Vince asked. Hunter grabbed the Glock from his top drawer, then placed it in his safe. Yes. Then get your ass moving. Levi's expecting you. Okay. Hunter emailed the property list to himself, then shut down the computer. I'll call you back with more details as you drive. Vince disconnected. Hunter grabbed his gear, jumping into the car. He didn't fully understand Vince's plan, but he trusted both Vince and Levi with his life. Therefore, he was willing to trust Brooklyn's life to Vince's plan. Chapter 30 Dante felt like the devil had personally came to earth to rip his soul apart and drag him back to hell for all his sins. The two women that meant so much to him were in grave danger. Brooklyn was still missing. Kane was coming for Lang. The decision to keep Lang out of field was a hard-fought battle. While Lang gave him hell about taking her out of the field for the remainder of the case, he could see in her eyes that she was relieved. He kept three guys with her at all times, but felt even that wasn't enough. He was close enough to almost see the safe house Lang was staying in. He planned to check in with her this morning before heading to the airstrip and hopping on a short flight to get to the location on his list where Kane might be holding Brooklyn. The first thing he noticed when the safe house came into view was that no one was on the front door. He parked out front, pulled out his firearm, and rushed out of the car. The front door opened just as he reached for the knob. Dante, is everything okay? Peter asked after noticing Dante's drawn weapon. Why aren't you on the door? He put his beretta away and stepped inside. Where's Lane? Dante asked after not seeing her in her usual spot at the table in front of her laptop. She left with Stephen and Robert after opening the envelope you mentioned when you called her from the office. Peter answered as he returned to the breakfast he'd left in the kitchen. Dante followed him to the kitchen. Who brought it over? Bill came over to give Lang an update on Ryan. He said he figured she wanted to see it, so he brought it to her. He replied between taking bites of his food. Dante pulled out his cell, noticing the missed call from Lang. He tried to call her back. Damn it, he jammed it back into his pocket when he got her voicemail. What's wrong? He held up the envelope he brought with him. This was the envelope I was referring to. What the hell did Bill deliver to her? I don't know, Peter shrugged his shoulder. I was on door duty. Why didn't you go with her? She's supposed to have three people with her at all times. Dante got a sinking feeling at the pit of his stomach. Bill went. He was supposed to relieve me in two hours. Decided he'd start early. I was going to wait until Robert replacement arrived to let them know what was going on before I left. I need to get in touch with someone on that team ASAP. If you can't, turn on their tracker and send another team after them. Dante looked around, praying that Lang left her laptop, notebook, or something. He retrieved his laptop from the SUV, then ripped open the envelope that had been addressed to Lang. It contained a note and what looked like a movie DVD. The note said, the answers you seek to find a monster can be found here. Just follow the instructions. Dante loaded the disc into his laptop. A login screen appeared. He glanced at what appeared to be login information written below the message on the note. When he entered it, an icon popped up on the screen. He clicked on it and saw two file folders. One contained a request for 15 to 20 men to guard an old warehouse. Dante kept looking at the address. It looked so familiar. He minimized the window, pulling up his list of possible properties where Brooklyn might have been taken. He enlarged the screen to see if there were any other details in the files, then logged into the email to send the file over to the office. As he glanced through it one final time, he realized he hadn't opened the second folder. Dante double-clicked on it, finding a request for a specialized 30-man team to acquire a target and transport it to a drop-off location. His heart sank when he clicked the link to see who the target was, and a photo of Lane popped up. No longer did he wonder what was in the envelope that Bill delivered. It was bait to draw Lane out. Dante knew, looking at the details in the file, they didn't stand a chance. Only a psycho would send 30 people after one woman. From the doorway, Peter shouted, I couldn't get any of them. 
Our team is trying to track them now. I'm pretty sure I know where they're going. It's a warehouse on one of the remote properties Kane bought, Dante said, closing his laptop. We'll need every available person that's in the area on this. Find out if we can get an additional plane at the airfield to be ready to fly into the same general area as this address. He glanced around looking for a sheet of paper, but when he couldn't find one, he pulled out his phone and texted it to Peter. And see if there is a private airport closer to that address. I'm on it, Peter headed to the other room. Dante put his cell up as he called out, Hey, what time did Lang leave? About 45 minutes ago, Peter yelled from the other room. Damn! He slammed his fist against the table. There was no way the team, even breaking every speed limit, would make it to her in time. Kane most likely already had Lang. The address was nearly an hour away in traffic. Plus, there was the 10 to 15 minute drive from the private airstrip. Dante headed to the weapons room to pack up for the trip. Lang tried to get Dante again to let him know where they were headed. Now she wished she had actually left a message on the voicemail since they weren't headed to a cell phone dead zone. She hadn't expected to not be able to get a call through. The traffic was fairly light for this time of day, but Lang tried to keep an eye out for suspicious vehicles. She looked over the contents of the envelope again. Get off at the next exit ramp and turn back around, she stated, pulling out her rugger finger on the trigger. She started glancing in the side view mirror. I thought meeting this person who has information on who came paid off was important, Bill said, already in the lane to exit. Lang eyes carefully scanned their surrounding. Yes, it would be if it wasn't a setup. Robert drew his weapon and angled his body so he could see out the back window. Why do you think that? Who else knows that the deranged doctor is alive? The story isn't in the news. Lang was mentally kicking herself for jumping the gun. How would that person know to specifically contact me? You do realize we're nearing the exit we would have taken to reach the address, Bill asked. Lang glanced at the clock. I thought you said 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah, but the traffic was light. Well, get off and head back to where we came from, she ordered. Going anywhere near that address would be extremely dangerous for us. Bill put on his turn signal. Everybody was on alert for trouble. They didn't notice anything strange. The only car that got off with them was a small compact car, and it turned in the opposite direction as they turned under the viaduct to reach the on-ramp. Shit, people, we have a problem, Robert announced when a construction truck pulled off the back road and blocked the traffic. Bill glanced in the rearview mirror, then sped around the car in front of him, making a crazy turn onto the ramp. Blocking them at the top of the ramp was what appeared to be a state trooper. Bill slammed on the brakes. He couldn't go straight and he couldn't go left because of the Vodak wall. The driver stepped out of the fake patrol car, drew his gun, and aimed. Bill threw the truck into reverse, but slammed on the brakes as another SUV turned onto the ramp. I think we can make it to that access road over there, Lang shouted as the fake trooper took out one of their tires. Bill maneuvered the SUV over the road, over the gravel, and onto the grass. They were about to hit the side road when an 18-wheeler turned out on the gas station and stopped in front of them. Bill turned the steering wheel wildly, but couldn't avoid hitting the 18-wheeler's back end with the right side of the SUV. What are you waiting for, Bill yelled over the screeching tires. Shoot back at them. Lane looked in the mirror. Both vehicles that had blocked the ramp were now following them. There's no way I'm shooting out the side window the way you're driving. We're returning fire out the back window. Robert grabbed the weapons bag and unzipped it. Bill lowered the back window as Robert and Steven took aim. This was definitely not the day I expected, Steven stated as they took out the front tires of both cars. It only slowed them down. Hitting the emergency beacon in the underbelly of the dashboard would let the office know that they were in trouble and give their location. Lang asked, are our specialty items in the bag? I think so. Robert went into the bag and handed Stephen the unit. Shut the cars down. Lang felt like the 18-wheeler was a mile long. They had yet to clear it, but the 18-wheeler was moving as well. They loaded on the electropulse device into the delivery system. 
He fired twice, which activated the units. They headed to the targets and caused the engines of the two cars trailing them to stall. Stephen dropped the unit and picked up the assault rifle. Lane looked ahead. Once they could clear the truck, they had a good chance of making it to the next exit and onto the highway. Use lethal force if they keep coming. Let's not give them a chance to. They're multiplying like roaches, people, Robert shouted as more cars passed the two stalled vehicles. They ducked as bullets pinged off the body of the truck. Shit! Lang rolled down her window as the door of the 18-wheeler opened and an automatic rifle came into the view. She shot at the door until the gun retreated into the cab. Lang called out, Guys, I'm going to need something more than this pea shooter. Stephen passed her a larger weapon. We don't have enough firepower to handle this. I know. If we can make it back to the highway, we'll stand a chance, Bill stated. No, he bellowed as barricades came into view at the end of the road. Go through them, Lang commanded, still firing at the cab of the truck as they passed it. Turning back onto her seat, she buckled up and prepared to crash through the barricades, hoping there was nothing else waiting beyond them. A pickup truck came off the back road in front of the 18-wheeler. Lang didn't see it until she felt the impact of it slamming into them and her crushing metal. Her shoulder hit Bills as the truck careened on two wheels, mowing a path through the grass. The SUV tipped over onto the driver's side and skidded before finally coming to a stop. Bills' motionless body was pinned against his door. Lang's side of the truck was in the air. She shook him, but he didn't respond. She took his pulse. At least he was still alive. When she unbuckled herself, she grasped the seatbelt tightly so gravity wouldn't make her fall onto Bill. She rotated her body so that her back was propped against Bill's massive shoulder. Then she planted her feet against the door and grabbed her gun off the floor, preparing for battle. Not hearing any movement on the back seat, she glanced over the right shoulder. Stephen's body had slammed into Robert's. Robert, Stephen, you okay? She asked. Robert's out cold and bleeding, but still breathing. Stephen responded. He shifted his body, trying to reach what Lang assumed was either his weapon or the weapon's bag. Why is it so silent? Lang asked, noticing that the vehicles that hit him had stopped moving. Stephen looked out the back window. I don't know, but we definitely have more company approaching, he stated as he tried to shift Robert to get the weapon's bag. Damn it. The weapon's bag is jammed under him. Lang fired shots through the window in the direction of approaching footsteps, while Stephen tried again to get the guns in the bag. Lang, a voice called from beyond the SUV. All we want is you. If you put down your weapons, your team lives. She glanced at Stephen, who moved to the opening between the front seats. Don't do it. Our boss will prefer we deliver you alive, the voice explained from a closer distance, but he will accept your dead body. Through the windshield, Lang could see that men aiming AK-47 rifles at the windshield had come dangerously close to the SUV. There were too many for her to take out without getting herself and the others with her kill. She yelled, fine, I surrender. Then whispered to Stephen, I fully expect you and the team to come find me. Lucky for you, an intimidating Asian man said as he peered down inside the passenger side window. You're more valuable to us alive. Now put your weapon down, he demanded. And you in the back seat, keep your hands where I can see them unless you want my men to blow your head off. Lang placed her gun on the floor and rested her feet on the seat. When the man extended his hand towards her, she reached up and allowed him to clasp her hand in his. With one violent tug that felt like it would dislocate her shoulder, he dragged her out of the window and lowered her into the bed of the pickup truck that had hit them. When he hired 30 men to retrieve you, we thought it was overkill, but clearly it was necessary. The man who appeared to be the leader stated before jabbing a needle into Lang's arm. Hope you enjoyed today's story. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Until next time, be and stay blessed.